yeah, it's amazing that now it's come out into the world and this story that's been brewing inside of me for so long is finally being being read by many people. What's fascinating is that there was a secret reactor hidden under a lake. I know, we all live in a James Bond movie. Um, and I thought, Jesus Christ, I want to read a novel about this. Where's the novel? When I got back from Sarajevo, I was, you know, it was very, I was very weighed down by these war stories and was quite depressed for a year. It took some time for me, for it to sink in and for it to come out as fiction. It's a bit of a love letter to Sarajevo, basically. That was what I wanted, like that, that core of humour, the ability to look horror in the eye and not care. I really wanted to include him in the book because I think he's an excellent example of octopus independence and everybody should know about him. Running since 2016, the prize supports and celebrates the best new adventure writing of the last year. Celebrates adventure fiction as a genre, from the books on the shortlist to the writers who write them and the readers who read them. And the librarians and library staff who select the long and short lists for us look for the novels which both honour the traditions of adventure and those which are unafraid to try something new. And both of these novels, which we're discussing today, surprised us. For one, even though the physical journey only really comes at the end, the courage, resilience and endurance the protagonist showed shone through and planted us firmly in another place in time. And for the other, the humour and the characters absolutely delighted us. And although both authors deal with the effects of conflict and trauma and really devastating situations, these are books we absolutely adored. So without further ado, um, Priscilla, we're going to come to you first. I believe um, you've got a short reading from Black Butterflies to treat us to. Um, and if you could also just introduce yourself quickly, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you, Georgina. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, I am joining you from Ireland. Uh, it is in my study where I write. Uh, it's very green and wet outside, raining as usual in Ireland. So I'm a, I'm a fiction writer from London um, and I lecture in creative writing at University College Dublin. Uh, I have an MA and a PhD in creative writing from the University of East Anglia. And my father is English, uh, I grew up in London, but my mother is from Sarajevo. She left long before the war, um, uh, but my grandparents and most of her relatives were trapped in Sarajevo when war broke out in 1992. And my debut novel, Black Butterflies, is uh, an attempt in part to better understand the siege that turned many of my relatives into refugees. Um, I'll read from a section about a quarter of the way through. So Zora, the protagonist, who's a 55 year old artist and teacher who's floundering at the midpoint of her life. And she sent, sends her husband and mother off to safety in England when unrest starts. She of course doesn't realize full blown war is just around the corner. And this section happens at the beginning of May, 1922, and there's a massive shelling uh, campaign on Sarajevo and Zora is caught in the middle of it. Glass crunches and the air is dark and thick with the smell of burning in Marshall Tito Street. Smoke pours into Zora's throat. Coughing and retching, she crawls on her hands and knees through the sharp debris, gasping in the clearer air close to the ground. Everything is growing black when two powerful hands clasp her and pull her behind a sandbag wall into the doorway of a grocery shop. She is brought down to a cellar beneath the store where a dusty shaft of light falls through a grill from the street above and reveals the shapes of others huddled on crates. A glass of water is pressed into her hands. It is dank and cool here with the smell of rotting vegetables. As Zora's eyes adjust, she makes out she is in the company of the burly grocer, a crop-haired teenage girl, two old men, and a dog who does not seem to belong to anyone. With each explosion, the dog whimpers and more dust and rubble fall through the grill. The girl's eyes widen and dart from wall to wall. Zura cannot see either man's facial expression in the dim light, but smells the sourness of their body odors in the cramped space. She holds her breath and turns away. 
The scent of fear is such an animal smell, so humiliating, though she knows she'll be omitting it too. The walls of the cellar judge her again, and the dog starts up a high, continuous whine. This is it. She's going to die here, entombed in a cellar surrounded by strangers and cabbages. The people are so close to each other, their knees touch. The stone wall is hard and damp against her back. The sweat from earlier has dried into a crisp, sticky layer on her limbs, and she is shaking with cold. She closes her eyes and says her husband and daughter's names over and over again inside her head like a mantra. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Um, beautifully read, um, and that was absolutely magical. I think one of the, the most special things about Black Butterflies is the journey that we go on with Zora as readers and those moments of realization that she has, we're having them at exactly the same time. Yeah. Um, so we will come back to you in a little bit, um, but we will now go over to Natasha. Um, Natasha, I believe you also have a reading from The Half-Life of Valeri Kay. Um, and if you could also start with a brief introduction to yourself um, and perhaps where you are as well, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Um, thank you, everyone. If my internet is glitchy, I'm really sorry. Um, so a big problem with doing this from China is that China has this thing called the Great Firewall, ha ha, um, and it blocks a lot of Western internet traffic. So I'm using weird workarounds and VPNs and they don't always work. So if I cut out, I'm so sorry. I'm definitely here with you <laughs> in spirit. Um, but meanwhile, so my name's Natasha. Um, I also did a creative writing master's degree from the University of East Anglia, um, but this is not my debut novel. This is novel number five. I'm an, I'm an old lady now when it comes to writing books, um, but this is actually my favourite one. Um, so I'm really, really pleased that this is the one that's um, that's been shortlisted for this incredible prize and that I get to talk to you about. Um, it's set in the Soviet Union in the 1960s um, and it follows a scientist who's kind of been abandoned in the one of the strangest places I've ever heard of. It's real. There was a nuclear disaster there. It's been thoroughly covered up. But if you visit a place today called Chelyabinsk, you will assuredly see people who are missing limbs because they were born in very radioactive conditions. Um, so this is the setting of the book. Um, the narrator's name is Valery Kolkanov, and it's after him the book is named. Um, he's a very cheerful scientist and who remains cheerful despite being in a gulag. Um, and he kind of fumbles through most of the novel, actually rather enjoying himself most of the time. Um, so if you enjoy slightly dark humour and many off-colour jokes and maybe the occasional octopus, I'm really hoping this book is for you. But um, I'm going to do a little reading. And because I do not have a copy of the book with me um, in Shanghai, I couldn't fit very much in my suitcase. I'm just going to read the very beginning because that's what I can find on Amazon. <laughs> so this is chapter one, which is an unexpected departure. And it starts in um, a prison camp called Kalima in Siberia in 1963. Possibly because French made it sound fancy and respectable, the wake-up call for the prisoners was called Revali. In fact, it was just one of the guards banging a bit of pipe against an iron bar outside the barracks. If he was in a good mood, the guard would take rhythm requests. On what Valery Kolkanov didn't yet know was his final morning, it was blue suede shoes. Valery eased himself upright, one hand in the roots of his hair, because it was frozen to the pillow. The Hessian blankets crackled. There was frost on the top side of the weave. He touched the rafters, which were just above his head and sparkling too, and bent forward to stretch out his shoulders. Something fluffy scuffled into his lap and squeaked. Boris, the sociable rat. Valeri stroked his ears in the dark. For reasons known only to himself, Boris stole nails from all over the camp. He gave Valeri the latest and then rolled over to have his tummy scratched. Who's a good rat? Valeri said, pleased. Everyone used nails as needles for darning, and if Boris brought 
four or five a month, Valerie could get an entire can of condensed milk just by selling them on. He wasn't sure why Boris had decided that he, Valerie, ought to get the nails, but he wasn't in the habit of looking gift rats in the mouth. He bent his neck to see through the small window beside him. The frost was thick on the inside, blurring the halogen lamp on the camp perimeter. He brushed some off. It was snowing. There was still a clear 40 minutes before the start of the labour shift, and those 40 minutes stretched out beautifully. He pulled the physics textbook from under the straw mattress and tipped it to the light of the halogen. He preferred to read over the lessons before he had to teach them to the administrator. He would never have needed to, or not before, but lately he could feel his mind effervescing like one of those headache cure tablets in a glass of water. He wasn't losing memories, it wasn't as straightforward as that, but it was getting harder and harder to think. God sake, you tart, just lie down and keep the warm in. This from his bunk partner, whose name he had forgotten because they rarely spoke. Valeri gave him Boris to hold. They didn't know each other well, but in winter it was ridiculous to sleep alone. At the barracks door, the long bar made a grinding noise as the guard pulled it out from the handles. The doors opened, letting in a blast of frozen air and the old men on light duties. That was a joke, light duties. The first thing they did in the morning was light the four lamps. The lamps were kerosene. They sent a clean chemical smell across the musty space, which looked like a barn, but stacked with bunks and men instead of hay bales. Valeri read for a little while, then closed the book and slid down to the ground past two other bunks and four other men. Hay crunched under his boots. Other eyes followed the boots. He was one of only three men in the barracks who had real boots, not tied on rags. Hand those over, someone said, someone knew. Valeri pushed his sleeve back to show the tattoos on his arm. Bugger, the voice mumbled, sorry. And that's it. Fantastic as well, thank you so much. Um, I think we knew from the instant that we were reading those opening pages exactly what Valeri's like. It's just a wonderful kind of voice that you've given him as the character, um, as the protagonist. Um, and obviously, as the book goes on, we get to know him better and better. But that opening scene really, really gives you a good grounding. Um, so thank you for choosing that to read as well. Um, so I'm going to start with some questions uh, for today's event. Um, and Priscilla, we're going to come back to you. Um, and Natasha, I'm going to ask you the same question in a minute. Um, but I'd like to go right back to the beginning and ask you where the inspiration for Black Butterflies came from and how it became a book, your route to publication, how it got out into the world. Um, so the initial inspiration was over 25 years ago when I was at my grandfather's funeral at the Serbian Orthodox Church in Notting Hill. My father had rescued my grandparents from the siege uh, 10 months into the war he went out he bought a flak jacket and he he rescued them from the war and this part of that has fed into black butterflies this story but my grandfather came um to London he lived with us for a bit and then um in a flat but he never really recovered from the war and he died a, a couple of years later I mean you know he was an old man it was incredibly awful and disruptive to be taken from his hometown at that age and he never really learned English it was at his funeral though that my mother tapped me on the shoulder and she said you see that man over there and I turned around and I saw this man in a a brightly colored check shirt with a daffodil in his lapel and I said yes she goes well he's your great uncle and he used to be a well-known uh respected uh, landscape painter in Sarajevo and he had his studio above the National Library which was shelled there was this catastrophic fire that burnt over two million books and his his life's work and his studio went up in flames and she said you know and he she told me his story and that he had managed to escape Sarajevo on a Red Cross convoy and he went through a period of not painting never thinking he'd paint again but Gradually, he began to recover and he sort of reconnected with nature and started painting again. And I looked at him and he was sort of the same age as my grandfather, <clears throat> but he was so full of life. And he, through his painting, he joined an arts club in the 
the west of England and he went on painting for the next two decades of his life and for me it was such a sort of uplifting story of art and managing to you know with his personal war story to overcome the tragedy of dislocation and war through his art that I just thought I've got to write this and I tried it in many ways as a piece of journalism as a short story even as a children's story and it wasn't until about 10 15 years later when I did my master's in creative writing at UEA that I finally decided to write it as a novel and I have to say it took a long time uh it took 13 years to get this novel <laughs> from initial point of writing to being published a lot of research went into it uh he shifted to a she <laughs> during the writing of it it's it's fiction um but it's yeah it's amazing that now it's come out into the world and this story that's been brewing inside of me for so long is finally being being read by many people we're very pleased it was. Um, and how did it actually get out into the world? Once you'd finished your master's, you'd finished your first first draft of that manuscript, then what happened? I sent it uh, around to agents and my agent, Sophie Lambert, picked it up, uh, which is brilliant. And um, obviously an amazing, that was during lockdown, in fact. Uh, so I didn't meet her in the flesh for, for quite a while all done uh, obviously like this zoom calls and stuff um and she she sent it out um uh, and it eventually got picked up by Duckworth uh this amazing uh independent publisher that's been long established they just celebrated their 125th year this year and I was absolutely thrilled to work with my editor Rowan Cope who's just been amazing and her and Sophie have really got it and seen it and I felt incredibly supported by them um, and it was launched a year ago May 22 um, but you know and it did okay but not uh, not huge visibility but it was really when it got uh, nominated for the Women's Prize this year and for various other prizes and then of course for your prize that it's really become much more visible and sales have shot up and that's just brilliant and then week before last I went to Sarajevo and presented it at the Sarajevo Literature Festival so that was for me one of the highlights um, and it's being translated into Bosnian and it was really fantastic to read it to an audience of people of Sarajevans and to feel it sort of well it was coming home in that respect. It will be absolutely fascinating to hear how it's received when it's published yes. over there um, yeah. and I'm sure it will I'm sure it will be received well um, but congratulations on a fantastic debut novel. Thank you um, so much, thank you. And Natasha, um, if we could ask the same about the inspiration of Valeri Kay, and then possibly a little bit about not necessarily not necessarily Valeri's route to publication, but possibly your first novel, which I believe was The Watchmaker of Filigree Street. Um, Absolutely. Um, again, I'm really sorry if my if my internet cuts. Um, so let me let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so Valeri Kay comes from reading a book about Chernobyl. It's called Chernobyl. Um, it's by a really fantastic Ukrainian academic called Sergei Plochy. Actually, he's on the news quite a lot at the moment um, with regard to what might happen if the Zaporizhia plant, uh, or if anything goes wrong there. Um, so he's a nuclear specialist, but also a, um, a historian of science. I was reading his, his wonderful book about what happened at Chernobyl in 1986. And in a footnote, which is the best footnote I have ever read, um, it said, and of course, the scientists knew what to do at Chernobyl because this had happened before in Azyrsk in 1958. And I went, no, it didn't get in the bin. Of course, it what? There's, there's what? Another nuclear disaster? No, there, there was one. I, I looked it up and I went, oh. OK, there was a massive mystery nuclear disaster and we don't quite know what happened in this very eastern region of Russia in 1958. 
we can reconstruct more or less what might have happened. Something exploded and then the reactor exploded. Um, what's fascinating is that there was a secret reactor hidden under a lake. I know, we all live in a James Bond movie. Um, and I thought, Jesus Christ, I want to read a novel about this. Where's the novel? So I looked for one. I was I was looking in bookshops on Amazon and I went, oh, the Russians must have written about this. I couldn't find anything. Um, and then lockdown happened. I was like, right, well, I'll write a book about the mystery nuclear thing then. Brilliant. Um, and this, this was ill-advised because I didn't know any nuclear physics or Russian history or Russian. So those things had to happen at the same time. <laughs> um, so I got myself a huge reading list, learned Russian, I did a nuclear physics course, and kind of gradually, 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 bit by bit, I learned enough to cobble together something like a story. And so that's where it comes from. Um, how's my internet doing? Oh, 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 am it's I doing, still with It's you? doing really well, yep. We can see you, we can hear okay. you. <laughs> okay, that's, that's excellent. Um, path to publication with watchmaker of Filigree Street is completely obnoxious and I've got to apologise for it right now because otherwise all of you are going to be sitting there going, she needs a punch in the throat. I know I do and it's okay. Um, so I did a master's degree in creative writing when I was very young, um, my early 20s. And I did that really punchable thing where I walked straight out of university and straight into an agent's office. And that was that. I hadn't done any life experience at all before that. I, I wrote a novel knowing nothing about human beings or anything. Um, and by some miracle, they decided they wanted to publish it. And I edited it uh, while I was living in Japan. So I think like Priscilla, there was quite a long distance uh, relationship with the publishing industry at that point um, but I, I really shouldn't talk about it too much because it's so gross and disgusting and nobody needs to hear it. <laughs> be interested to know um, earlier you referred to The Half-Life of Valer Valeri Kay as your favourite of your five novels thus far um, and it is different from the others but what makes it your favourite? I worked really hard on this one <laughs> Um, previous previous novels have been have been difficult enough, but they've had a, a heavy speculative fiction fantastical element. Whereas with this one, I got about fifty thousand words in, and I was like, "Where's the magic bully? Where's it? Where's it gone?" And it didn't need it because radiation is so bizarre. You you don't need magic on top of that. But I I learned physics for this. I suffered. This is I'm very proud of this. <laughs> Rightly so, rightly so. Um, Priscilla, I know you had a question that you wanted to ask Natasha. Yeah, I've got many. I've, I'm, um, I haven't finished reading it, but I am about two thirds of the way through and I'm, I'm loving it. And it's also oh, thank hi. you for, you know, uh, doing your, you know, your your course in nuclear physics which is kind of amazing because you're you're through it I'm I'm really learning what radiation really is and you know all this sort of stuff so that's great but I did I was very curious to know if the um Shelley Binks uh uh disaster is still covered up in in Russia today or is it kind of openly acknowledged that is so that's a really, really good question. Um, and actually it's openly acknowledged. It's right. a kind of, if you talk to people from Chelyabinsk, it's common knowledge, it's kind of sad. Um, they wouldn't say that it's covered up, but it, it's, not it's not widely discussed internationally. I think internationally it was kept very quiet. The city where this happened is now called Ozyersk, which in itself is a code name, Ozera just means the lake, as in the lake the reactor was under. Um, it's still a closed city because they still produce um, everything radioactive, everything nuclear there. They supply the space program out of Kazakhstan, um, but they also, the, the facility is called Mayak, which means uh, the lighthouse. And they still have at least six reactors 
every now and then there's a huge radioactive plume that goes up from it. They are quite careless um, with some of their storage processes. They're also the guys who made the polonium that killed Alexander Litvinenko. So this is still very much an, an active closed city. And there, are, there were in the, in the 60s, dozens of closed cities across Russia, but they still exist today. And by closed, they mean you can't go in or out without a special pass. So I, I couldn't visit. Right, because yeah, I was wanting to know about when you were researching it, did you, you know, was it hard to, to research um, but for, for these reasons or did you find there was enough material um, to research it satisfactorily? I mean, again, a really good question. So I did I did get in touch with people and interview people. I interviewed a ballerina who worked at Chelyabinsk. Um, Chelyabinsk is 90 kilometers away from Ozyesk and they got this huge radioactive cloud. Lots of people came down with radiation sickness immediately. Um, so in some ways it was very tricky. In other ways, Actually, it was very simple because there's a wonderful scientist um, called Dr. Medvedev. His name makes me very happy because Medvedev means bear. So he's Dr. Bear. Um, and he wrote a really great expose of all the kind of the secret institute scientific stuff that was going on at this facility. Um, and he did that in the 1970s. And in the West, nobody believed him, um, which... It as sort of as one man, the scientific establishment went, don't be ridiculous. There's, of, of course, there can't have been a huge nuclear disaster we haven't noticed. And yeah, there, there was, and he was right. Um, and he's written a whole book about it. So that was incredibly useful. Brilliant. To lead on from there, I've got a question for both of you about um, how much creative license do you allow yourselves? Because obviously both of your novels are works of fiction, but based on true events to a certain extent. Um, how do you balance the historical ac accuracy and the imagination? Um, are they ever in conflict? Priscilla, I'll come to you first. Um, so for me, it was because part of the reason for me writing this was to understand the, the siege of Sarajevo better. It really was very important for me actually to really adhere to facts as much as I could. So for example, the, the whole timeline of the siege when everything happened. At one point I had oh, a sort of it all mapped out around my study on pieces of A4, this big timeline. And I, so I did, and at times that I felt quite restrictive. Like, so I, I did, I, I went to Sarajevo in 2011 and I lived there for five months and I interviewed people about their experience of the siege. And for me, what was really important was getting all the details of life under siege. You know, what is, it, what is it like to live when you're, the electricity is cut, when the the water is cut, when you're running out of food, when you can't go out in the streets because you might be shot by a sniper. I wanted to um, capture this as accurately as possible. And I was also fascinated by the individual stories people had and a lot of that, worked its way into the novel but when I got back from Sarajevo I was you know it was very I was very weighed down by these war stories and was quite depressed for a year it took some time for me for it to sink in and for it to come out as fiction and I think the creative license came really was when the character of Zora arrived for me so I did actually start writing it from a um with a male protagonist because inspired by my great uncle he was a man, but I found it just restricted me too much to sticking to almost a memoir type format. And I didn't want that. I wanted to explore it um, as a novel. And when Zora's character came to me in kind of quite a flash, I was in Norwich at the time and uh, she just arrived and she was redheaded. She was younger than my great uncle. She was this very strong, resilient woman. And then it kind of became my own and I could explore and go into the first 10 months of the siege, which is what this novel is about, um, with Zora for company. And it started becoming, it started springing to life and becoming fiction. Um, but it was an interesting, and I am now started, I started writing my second novel and it's much, it's kind of quite freeing because I, I, I haven't given myself this real 
need to stick so persistently to historical accuracy. Yeah. And I must say it's freeing. There's this one moment in Black Butterflies where Zora questions why the city is actually under siege and saying, yeah. I don't understand what's what's going on here. Um, what's the reader perception that you've found to, bla to Black Butterflies? Have, have most people been aware of the war in Sarajevo? Uh, there's pretty much a, like, I don't know, around 35, so people under 35, because it happened 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so under 35, 40, they're coming to me and they're saying, wow, I had no idea that this happened in Europe, in a country next to Italy, between Italy and Greece, um, you know, at the end of the last century, 30 years ago. And so that for them, that's brilliant for me to hear because they're doing a, a lot of reading about it and finding out about it. Um, people sort of older, 45 and older, um, will remember it from it being sort of second or third item on the news for four years. Um, but it kind of creates, you know, they're, they're talking about how it sheds new light on it and creates a real empathy and understanding with what people were really going through. Because, and I think that was part of the reason I wanted to write it as well, because I was 19 and I was watching it on the news and I was horrified to see this country that I used to visit as a child and loved being presented in such a negative, violent way and not, and yeah, you know, I felt like, I oh, know, but it's such a beautiful country and the people are so warm and friendly and loving. And, you know, it's partly wanting to sort of correct this, um, this view of Bosnia that, that drove me to write it. It's a bit of a love letter to Sarajevo, basically. And it comes across the beauty of the city, regardless of the situation it's in. Um, it really does come across. Uh, Natasha, the same question for you regarding the um, creative license. Do you ever find that there's a fight between historical accuracy and your imagination? I think there's a there's a pressure that is historical accuracy, but I think it's a pressure that novelists need to resist because if you completely give into it, you end up writing. Um, I, th I think what Priscilla was talking about, like the big struggle, you end up writing memoir and that's a really different thing to write. It's much harder. You're much more shackled to well, precisely what did happen. And do you have proof? Do you have a diary entry from Tuesday the 10th at 9 a.m.? Because that's what you need. If you write historical fiction, what you have to do is find out what happened, but find a way to make it sound true. Um, in a way that it wasn't necessarily. Often you have to tidy up timelines to make it read more like a story. You have to tidy up characters and maybe conflate characters. The way that I wrote this was much more strict than I've written previous novels. Everything in it that happens, happened. Um, Valeri is completely fictional. Um, he's made up. He's based on real people. Um, he's, he's based quite heavily on um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn and some of his time in the Gulag. Um, he's based on various real scientists. There are characters in it who are real people. Um, but I needed him to be fictional because he needs to do things and go to places where it would be incredibly difficult for me to prove that anybody did. Um, so I think in that sense, certainly fiction is really, really necessary. You need it to take characters to all the places that they must go. You wouldn't necessarily be able to find a record of a real person who went there. And I say a record because that's the only way we can check this. I think the frustrating thing about writing history is that you can only use the records, with, whereas with historical fiction, you can say, well, what was likely? I don't have a record, but probably, what would a normal human being have done? Probably they would have done this. So, and, and so probably is good enough in fiction, but I think sometimes it, it allows you to create a very true sounding account. Um, in a way that you might not get if you were shackled to very, very strict memoir. Yeah, and I'd, I'd agree totally. And it is, it's about the 
that it sounds true and that we're interested as readers and writers in the sort of emotional lives of our, our characters. Um, and so it's very often history books and political books, they may give you a sort of framework to, to work with, but they're not the, certainly for me, the sources that really gave me the story. It was things like, well, tales, speaking to people themselves, but also things like collections of letters and diary entries. And it's the sort of personal stories that really give you the, the, the texture of, of fiction and life that you're, you're looking for in a novel. Yeah, I really agree. And I, and I don't know about you, but I was taking accounts from people who I'd spoken to, from interviews from people who I hadn't spoken to and accounts and diff different things and conflating them and making them into the experiences of one person. Yes. So that it all comes up. Yeah. Exactly. Leads very, very neatly into the next question I have for both of you, um, which is really about the character development of both Valeri and Zora. Um, and actually one of the reasons that we kind of paired the two of you together today, because Valeri, he goes from being a prisoner at the start of the novel, um, back to being a, a scientist and having some semblance of freedom. Um, whereas Zora goes from an artist and a teacher, um, free in her own city and life, to a figurative prisoner, really, in her own city. Um, how did you both approach that character development? Um, did you find there were different stages of your protagonists um, throughout the novels? Priscilla, um, you're nodding along. Well, I'm just thinking about it. It's yeah, it was really important for me to trace this. And I wanted I want readers to really understand who Zora is to start with. Um, and, you know, it starts off with a, a, a very long sentence, which tells you how she's floundering at the midpoint of her life and you know she's overwhelmed by everything she has to do the cleaning the errands the curating the teaching looking after people and it's this idea that this is normal life you're just thrown in normal life when you can't really get your head up and you're just overwhelmed by everything you have to do and then it gets turned upside down by war when you're you know something happens when you're least expecting it and I, it was very important to me to really build her character. She did come to me in this sort of flash, like I described, um, but also obviously I was very much drawing on my great uncles. Um, I interviewed him a lot about how he became an artist and what he did. And, you know, so I was very interested in her as a landscape painter and how she related to place. So place is very important to her. Um, and there is a section, towards the beginning of the novel where we kind of really go back into her past story so we really get a sense of herself and then you're thrown into what happens to her as a character as life becomes progressively more and more restricted and everything's stripped away and it's written in the present tense so it's kind of very immediate so you don't have a, a sense as, as a reader of will she survive or not or what's going you know what's going to happen next we're very much wed in the moment there with her you know we're surprised along with her as things happen and as the city shuts down and as everything is taken away um and so we do I mean I, I hope that she comes across very much as a fallible warm human being you know she has her ups and downs she's at times heroic she's at times not she's um at times depressed, she's at times incredibly resourceful and she uses her art and her teaching in a way to connect people and to, um, to you know, she draw, draws on her inner resourcefulness that she doesn't know that she has um, during the siege. Um, and also there's this, you know, the, these new relationships and friendships spring up with the neighbors around her. Um, so I drew on, her as a character, I think I spoke to a lot of people, a lot of women in particular, who really opened up to me about their experience of living through the siege. And their voices just stuck in my head. And I was seeing the war through a woman's eyes. And this all sort of 
a lot of remarkably strong women I talked to, and this sort of fed into her character. It does feel when when you read it for those those of you who haven't read it yet, um, you are really on that journey with Zora. Um, as she makes the decisions, you're making them with her. Um, and we might not be aware how much time is passing, whether it's been a day, whether it's been another week as they go into winter. Um, and I think that losing track of time is done absolutely beautifully. Well, thank um, you. That's very much what I wanted to get across and also why I didn't divide it into conventional chapters, because I wanted to show a lot of people said, you know, that's one of the first things life under siege what it takes from you is a sense of the regular you know weekdays and weekends because no one's working time is just running into each other and I wanted to sort of create that sense of time blurring and you're just you 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 just lose all sense of it I mean to be honest a little bit similar to a state of being in lockdown as we've all passed through when you just don't know when it's going to end yeah I did think that I thought of poor Zora afterwards and I won't give any spoilers so I'll stop there um and Natasha I'm going to ask you the same question about the character development of Valeri um and how you found that process as the as the story progressed um so the most important thing about his voice and for me and his whole character and the first thing that actually landed on the page is his humor um that's the key thing for me. I really wanted him to be funny and consistently funny and often like inappropriately funny when faced with very, very serious things, he will find them hilarious. Um, and the reasoning behind that is that I think when terrible things happen, most humans have one of two responses. One, and I think this is most people, probably including me, I don't think I have the mental strengths for the other thing. Um, we become very serious, we become pretty miserable, we stop laughing very much. But there's another kind of person, and I think this is about 10% of people, and I think we all know one, and if you don't know who it is, it's you. There's 10% of people who just become better, and they become incredibly funny, they become the kind of person who could almost cope with anything that if you know one they're kind of rock like they're amazing um and I, re I really wanted to write one of those people who just cannot be crushed and so the first chapter of of this book is Valerian a gulag which sounds like it should be horrendous it's not he's having a great time he's having a fantastic time he sort of he considers it this kind of weird mental test that he sort of consistently passes he's very pleased to get out but like he would survive if he went back as well and he knows that um when i was reading accounts and talking to people as well there were these two kinds of accounts and i think i have two favorite examples one is um a guy called shalomov who wrote um a collection of stories called tales from kalamar he was uh they're called ziaka ziaks um prisoners and he had the most horrible time. His stories are miserable and kind of full of this awful grit and you just come away crying. On the other hand is Alexander Solzhenitsyn who is very, very funny and wrote A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which I think everybody should read. My mum told me for ages that it was a really depressing book and I shouldn't go anywhere near it. And I read it and I like roared laughing all the way through because it's not a depressing book at all. It's fantastic and it's uplifting. And I think for stories and for, if you want readers to understand what happened in a very difficult, very tragic part of history I think one of the best devices you can use is a character who is kind of unkillably easily amused by everything because I think it's easier to read horror from the point of view from, of somebody who finds a lot of things very funny than somebody who is experiencing it completely raw all the time you often need to close that book and go away and have a cry whereas often a character who doesn't quite see it in the same way will allow you to get through it without that kind of awful secondhand suffering and I think some of some of the things that I wanted to write about some of the gulag stuff some of the nuclear disaster stuff 
in the hands of another character, it would have been far too heavy. I wouldn't have wanted to make people read that. It would be really depressing. Um, but the really important thing about Valeri is that, or what I hope, is that he can deliver things that should be horrendous with this kind of, but actually, you know, there's a funny side to this. And he, he does it consistently. And linked to that is kind of making him sound Russian enough. And if you talk to Russians who have survived, or you know, read accounts, or you speak to people who survived the siege of Leningrad, for example, there are all kinds of very, very funny, very, very dark stories involving often, you know, posing dead bodies in funny poses and giving them Superman cloaks and ridiculous, awful things. And yet they're laughing when they tell you. So it's just, yeah, I wanted to get away from this is going to be miserable 100% of the time. He has serious moments. He doesn't always succeed, but that was what I wanted. Like that, that core of humor, the ability to look horror in the eye and not care. Um, can I just come in here and say that well, I think you're very successful with that and uh, Valeria is a very likable uh, character and it's, it's, it's great to be sort of guided through uh, these terrible, this terrible situation with a sense of humour um, and it's interesting because obviously I was also faced with a, a similar <clears throat> decision to be made and I think that for me, whereas it, it's not humour, um, although interestingly enough, Bosnians do have a fantastic sense of humour. And um, one of my favourite right. novels about um, Sarajevo is written by uh, Nenad Felicikovic, which is called Lodgers. And it has got this amazingly black sense of humour. Um, and that was a, a really good source for me, actually. Um, but for me, it was the role of art um, that kind of had this similar function that it enabled uh, this resilience and moments of beauty in the novel to, you know, so that the, the, the reader isn't constantly hit around the head with the awfulness and the, um, with how harrowing it is, that there is this sort of, I call it artist resistance, that it kind of picks up and lifts and has this role to connect and to play a function in war that in some ways uh, 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 is, is a counter to, to, the, to the horror of war. I really agree. And I think you have to find a way to translate between people who've experienced that and people who haven't experienced that. Because I think often, even if they're speaking the same language, they actually can't communicate very well. So it's about finding a vehicle to make it understandable. Mm -hmm. Yep, yes. Um, we have had a couple of questions in, so I'm just going to ask one. Um, we only have a few minutes really left, so if anyone else listening does have questions, pop them in the chat now and we'll try and get to them. Um, but this one's for you, Priscilla. Um, if you were going to write an epilogue or a sequel to Black Butterflies, do you think Zora would be back in Sarajevo? Where do you think she'd be? Are you allowed to tell us that? It's a slightly spoiler in the question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, other people have asked me about this and uh, just, just to say there isn't going to be any epilogue. It, it does end slightly abruptly intentionally um, because I'm wanting to emphasize what it was like to be under siege when there was a complete disconnect. And, um, oh, sorry, could you read me the question again? I just, or oh, maybe do I can. You, do you think she'd be back in Sarajevo or where do you think she would be? I I don't feel I should answer this question because I think the novel ends where it ends for a reason and it's kind of the, up to the reader then to make sense of where it goes from there um apologies to no that's I think that's a wonderful answer an annoying answer to that question <laughs> For yeah. everyone who hasn't read the book yet, it will make sense when you do. Um, another question in, is there a historical era that either of our writers haven't set a story in that they would like to? So Natasha, I'll come to you first. Are there any eras that pique your interest? 
definitely. Um, so for me, it, it's ancient Greece. Um, the next book that, but one that's coming up will be set in ancient Greece. And I had to wait until this point in my career because I wasn't a good enough writer to do it yet. Um, but I'm really excited. I've been obsessed with it since I was, you know, two inches high. And I'm really, really hoping that it works. <laughs> what about you, Priscilla? Um, I, well, interestingly, when I started writing this, it was, you know, a while ago, and it was only 20 years since the siege. So then I didn't even really consider it historical fiction. And to be honest, I think I quite like the term contemporary historical fiction. And so for me, you know, I, I'd probably explore things that have happened within the 20th century. I don't think for me, I'm not interested in going further back into the past, but certainly interested in, in sort of key um, events and turning points within the 20th century. For both of you, thinking about your books uh, and readers today, do you think there are themes in the novels that resonate? in today's world do you think there's a message or an insight that you hope readers would take away um Natasha I'll come to you first with that one yeah um I think so I I grew up in this economically secure happy liberal bubble I was born in the 80s and I think I'm probably you know the that weird middle generation where uh, like everything was fine for us most of the time and I think if I read things or heard about um, events from outside my lovely happy bubble I was like oh but that that would never happen now and I think what lockdown really showed me is that fortunes turn you can be absolutely fine one minute and you can be in the middle of a pandemic in the next in the middle of a siege in the next and I wrote this book before the war in Ukraine began and when it did begin I was sort of wildly unsurprised in a political arena where everybody else I knew was shocked because it's so close it's basically in Europe it is now it's the 2020s how is this happening now and yet there was something about reading about the Soviet Union in the 1960s where I just went yeah well of course they invaded Ukraine of of course they did. Why, why are you surprised? And I was the only one out of every everyone I knew. So it was something this book did something <laughs> to me, certainly. Um, and that's very nebulous and vague, I know, but I have nothing more concrete. <laughs> Priscilla, how about you? Well, similarly, uh, a, a lot of readers have pointed out similarities with, with um the war in Ukraine and how you know there's been a lot of people under siege and it gives them an understanding of what's going on how war refugees are created real empathy with the process of becoming a war refugee and of course it um so I'm really grateful for that and and in fact uh Ukrainian refugees have come up to me and said they've read it and they really you know saw parallels so that's great and I suppose as as for a message it is just a creating of empathy with people who happen to be in these situations just as Natasha said it can happen to any of us is this understanding that normal life can be inverted and upended at any moment by forces beyond our control and we suddenly find ourselves the other the refugee and and also an understanding of how Sarajevo, Bosnia was a, a wonderfully pluralist society with different ethno-nationalities living side by side for centuries and getting on and how quickly that can invert and turn upside down and not to listen to, to voices of hatred and division. Appreciate every day. Yes. Um, thank you both so much. Um, we've got really one minute left. Um, so I just wanted to end on one question uh, for Natasha about the, the octopus. In this case, Albert. Um, but I know oct octop octopi. 
octopuses are a regular feature of your novels. Can you tell us a little bit about Albert and where he came from? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I love octopuses. They'll always make an appearance in my books. So it's, a, it's a theme for me. Um, Albert is based on a real octopus. Um, there was once an experiment run on three octopuses called A, B and C, and they were Albert, Bertie and Charles. Um, and it was about, you know, what you could train them to do, because of course octopuses are very, very clever things. Um, Octopuses B and C were very cooperative with the scientists and they would do all sorts of things in, in exchange for um, canned tuna. Albert did not like canned tuna. Albert would throw it at the researchers. Albert would only have live crabs. <laughs> and refused also to cooperate with any of the experiments. And on one memorable occasion, he clogged up the filter of his aquarium to spite the scientists with the tuna that he didn't like. So I really wanted to include him in the book because I think he's an excellent example of octopus independence and everybody should know about him. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so we will be ending there for today. Um, Natasha and Priscilla, before we say goodbye, is there anything you'd like to add? Just that it's been a complete pleasure to be here and really nice to meet you, Natasha, and, and hear about your, your book. Thank you. You as well. I think we've been very well matched up. This is, this is like a very professional sort of book matchmaking yes. service. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's nothing to do with us, really. It's two fantastic, two fantastic novels. Um, so thank you again to both of you for being part of the event. Um, and thank you to everyone else for tuning in. Uh, and all that leaves me to do is to wish you all a very good afternoon and hopefully see you all again soon. Thanks so much for coming. Bye. Thank you. Bye.